Oh, oh wait, Tyler's got it. Yeah. All right. Pizza. 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 Well, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. My name is Landis Hudson. I am the executive director of Maine Rivers. We're a statewide advocacy organization, and our mission is to protect, restore, and enhance the ecological health of Maine's river systems. Um, I am here to um, share my deep concerns about um, metallic mining in Maine. I'm not going to repeat much of what you've heard from many other eloquent and interesting people today, but I will simply let you know, um, as you can see in the testimony that's being submitted, we do have very serious concerns um, about the uh, rules that you're reviewing. And um, I'd also add um, the long process has been um, difficult and challenging as well. So I remember back in March of 2012 <coughs> when this um, process first started. And um, along with many other people, we were very uh, concerned that the proposed rules were being moved along fairly quickly. Um, obviously, there have been, been many other um, steps along the way. However, we are not um, satisfied that the rules that you're looking at today really would adequately protect the water quality of our state. And as the um, director of a statewide advocacy organization, I can tell you that Maine's water quality is tremendously, um, it's remarkable. And it's a true asset to our state. And there are many other states that are jealous of our resources. As such, we have a great um, obligation to do the best that we can to uh, protect it and to move forward. And I'd also add that a lot of my um, work currently is um, with towns and communities that are trying to restore their waterways. So it comes as, a, uh, I guess, a certain shock to me to try and think how um, these rules could potentially open up, unleash um, very serious water quality problems when many of us, um, my organization and many, many other people are working so hard to reverse a lot of the um, uh, older industrial uh, pollution problems um, in the state. So as such, um, some of the reasons that we don't um, support these rules have been touched on by other people. I'll simply say the uh, definition of mining area has been brought up over and over again. That is still a great concern. The groundwater definition uh, perplexes me that that is um, also a problem. Um, there is note in the um, rules of treatment for 30 or 100 years that I'm understanding is not the intent. However, for people like me, when we read the rules and there is note of what to do for 100 years, that's a really big red flag and a, and a grave concern. Uh, we would, of course, like to see that everything could be taken care of within 10 years. Uh, wet mine waste unit, also red flag. And of course, the um, financial assurances um, we want to see that wrapped up better and paid in full. And that's it. Wow. OK. Great well, job. Thank you. Uh, Candy. Candy. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Yes, go ahead, Representative Duchesne. Thank you very much, uh, Senator. You just wrapped up about four to five big talking points, which seems to be the big four or five that we need to keep working on. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there a global universe of other things out there that has not been mentioned yet? Or are we really focusing on these problem areas? The big question is that you're dealing with a huge uncertainty. And even with best practices, even with tremendous amounts of fi um, financial assurances, even with uh, brilliant scientists and engineers that truly know what they're doing, you're dealing with a very, very risky proposition. And some of us uh, have seen um, people like Dr. David Chambers come in and give presentations on that and describe with um, a very um, neutral background, some of the disasters that happen even when you, when you really do your best. Thank you. I have one, any other questions? One quick question. Were you a part of the group that provided some information to Representative Duchesne? Nope, not really. I mean, <laughs> I'd be happy Just to. Ask. <laughs> hey, she's my constituent. I'm not taking on her. <laughs> Landis, thank you. Sure. Thank you for the work with the towns. That's really important. That okay. They really don't have the resources. And uh, so I appreciate you taking that effort and going to a different direction than you've gone before, which is well appreciated, okay. I think. Thank, Thank you. you. Nick Bennett. Time's up. <laughs> Jeff has a cold, so I'm trying to stay away from 
I got one too, so stay away from me too. Now you tell me. Sorry. Yeah, really, now you tell us. I've been staying in my zone. I haven't creeped over. Senator Saviello, Representative Welsh, and members of the Environment and Natural Resources Committee. My name is Nick Bennett. I'm the staff scientist for the Natural Resources Council of Maine. I'm not going to read my testimony. Um, I'm going to confine my comments to just really I want to focus on, on one thing. Um, I, I want you to know that I strongly disagree with uh, a couple of people who said that these proposed rules are more, more protective than the old rules. I don't believe that. And I think that if you choose as a legislator to, as a legislature to um, reject these rules and direct DEP through statute to come back with another set of rules, um, that it is not a problem to leave the 1991 rules in effect. And the reason that uh, I think that the um, 1991 rules are more protective, um, if you turn to um, the third page of the, my testimony that I handed out, and it's actually, it says page one because it's an attachment, and I was part of the group that, of groups that gave information to Representative Duchesne, but um, we also gave this sheet to the whole committee last Friday. Um, so if you look at number two, that compares the uh, groundwater protection standards in the 1991 rules with the proposed rules. And the 1991 rule says you can't contaminate groundwater. And the proposed rules say you can contaminate groundwater infinitely underneath the mining area, whatever that might be. So that's a huge difference between the 91 rules and the proposed rules, and I think the uh, 91 rules are much more protective on that score. Another area where the uh, two 1991 rules are much more protective is in number four on that sheet that I handed out to you, and that is the baseline requiring monitor, uh, baseline monitoring requirements are much more specific and extensive. Um, they give a list of chem chemicals you're supposed to test for. They require testing for radioactivity. The uh, proposed rules do not. They don't provide this uh, specific list of things to test for when you're doing baseline monitoring. And I think those are two very important um, differences between the rules and places where the 1991 rules are stronger than the proposed rules. So with that, I, I think you all know the big areas that we've talked about today um, or that others have talked about today perpetual treatment, the definition of mining area, having enough financial assurance, and uh, protecting our most important public lands and uh, highest quality water bodies from the impacts of mining. Those are the key issues that I think you have to wrestle with. I do think it's fine if you wrestle with those in statute and direct DEP to come back um, with another set of rules, and I'm not worried about the 91 rules remaining in effect. Thank you. Representative Duchesne. Thank you, uh, Senator. I think you've clarified something for me that I got wrong in my synopsis. I can't uh, believe it. I know. It. Well, <laughs> my intention is not to be right in that synopsis. It's to get all the information I can in a form that we can all read it and try to get on the same page. And I think I misunderstood the rule that, the, that you referenced here, the baseline monitoring. Um, I thought when I first read the rule, this is what they're going to have to monitor forever. This is what you're really talking about is you've got to do this testing up front for all these chemicals and potential right. pollutants that's, and that's, then determine what's supposed to be monitored. Right, because you have to have a control for mm -hmm. what happens going forward. You need to know yeah. what the background levels are. Well, for anyone curious, that may get revised. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? I have one. Because follow up on the same thing. So is it because it doesn't say it in there? Because when I read this, this is typical of an array for anything you do in the state of Maine, whether it's landfill or other things that you have to test for, and then you prove, actually there's a pesticide list and a whole bunch of other stuff, that you have to prove that you don't have it. So is it not clear in the law and the rules? Correct, it's not, it's Clears. left blank. So, but they, It just they, says you need to do baseline monitoring. monitoring. So, but that's still an open definition. So in your case, you believe it needs to be stronger. DP may argue that that's what they normally do. Okay, I understand, thank you. Helps. Under that helps a lot. Yeah, Representative White. Hi. First, I just wanted to thank you for coming in. Um, I, I think you've been able to answer a couple questions for me, uh, one being the million-dollar question, um, being young and new. This uh, 1991 law was drafted when I was born, so <laughs> I'm, I'm not necessarily up to date and familiar with it. So, yeah. 
I'll eat my lunch first, don't worry. Um, the question I had was, uh, is this new law uh, more or less restrictive and protective than the law before us today? And should we or should we not reject the law that's before us today and fall back on the other one until this one is redrafted and come back to us? Yes, right. the second. So one thing I just, if it's okay to make clear, since, since you're new, is that what you've got before you today isn't a law, it's rules or a regulation. Right, and the, I'm sorry. That's okay. And the 1991 rules are also rules. They're not a law, they're a regulation. So yes, I'm comfortable with the 1991 rules remaining in effect until the legislature gets these, the updates to that rule correct. And these proposed rules I do not believe are as protective as the 1991 rules. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. I was just referring back to the emergency part of the uh, rules that are uh, in front of us today. And I was just referring is back, I mean, is it really an emergency or are we better off with the rules that are already in place? I think we're better off with the rules that are, are in place and it's not an emergency. Thank you. Representative Welsh. Yeah, I would just clarify too for uh, the good representative is that the, it's the statute the law that then determines how the rules are built. So the rules have to follow exactly kind of what the law says. So even if DP wanted to do something different, if it didn't conform to the law itself, they couldn't do that. If well, it's oh, so correct. I, I, Am I? That, go ahead. So I, I would suggest that one way for the committee to proceed is to make changes in statute that deal with some of these big issues that we've touched on and redirect DEP to come up with rules accordingly. Other question, I have a question. And Nick, I just want to make sure you're on the record. You, you, I've gotten this list of 10, and I wrote back to you and said, so if we fix these 10, you're OK with the rule? Right, I said yes. Unqualified. <laughs> fix them. And then do you have anything else out there that after we do those 10, the new list comes in? I don't know. I'm, I might get something wrong like, Representative Duchesne too, but I said yes and I meant it. Okay, just checking. Representative Duchesne. Thank you, and just for the record, I'm not going to limit myself to getting just one thing wrong. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, uh, can you comment on the, the whole uh, mining on public lands thing? Uh, obviously, there's been some recent discussion about Title 12 actually allows mining on certain public lands. Uh, were you familiar with that, and what part of the conversation should we be having about this? Well, I think, you, you know, you, you have an opportunity here um, with these rules to deal with, with, with both with the rules and with the statute and and again this may be a something that needs to be addressed in statute and not in the rules the reason that this issue came to my attention is because the 1991 rules are silent on public lands mm -hmm. and there's a whole lot of stuff in these rules about public lands and then i thought geez what do we want to do with our public lands do we mm -hmm. want to have mines on them how far away should the mines be my answer to that is no, and they should be a mile away. So if, if Title 12 specifically says we permit mining, I would suggest the committee look into revising that. I don't think that that's what our public lands are for. It seems to me that would be an opportunity to create a bill that would mention uh, Title 12 and go off to the ACF committee and they're going to wonder what we ever did to them. <laughs> that, that, and I'm on that committee. That. <laughs> that, as they say, is your problem. No, it's, sir, I mean, they've done some stuff to us before. I'm not against it. <laughs> uh, uh, just a similar question. You, you've indicated that what we should do is change the statute and then change, send the rules back to them. But there are of us that might feel like we'll change the rules and then change the statute that reflects it. That's another alternative, correct? I think you, you're the boss here. You guys make those decisions. I'm just no telling can. you. Please. No. I'm telling you that I, I, that's the direction that feels comfortable to me. It gets you out of the bind of having to go against the APA, which is something the legislature put there for a reason. Um, but that's, you're the legislature. I'm just making recommendations. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, Nick. Ben Gilman. Then Jeff Reardon, then Anthony, then Jen. Right, is Jen still here? No, no she's gone. Okay. She did hand in written testimony. Yeah, we got it. Yes, yeah. we got it. 
Good afternoon, <clears throat> Senator Saviello, Representative Welch. My name is Ben Gilman. I represent the Maine State Chamber of Commerce, here to deliver our testimony in support of LD-146. In order to save time, I'm going to jump down to the fourth paragraph of my written comments that are coming around. Uh, we, are all, we are well aware that a prosperous Maine requires investment in job creation and a commitment to protecting our environment. In compiling Making Maine Work, we surveyed businesses across the state and were told over and over again, Maine's two greatest economic development assets are its quality of life and its loyal, hardworking workforce. As Mainers, we value and respect our workforce. We also understand that to keep talented, skilled workers in our state, we need to create and retain quality jobs, the type the mining industry would bring to Maine. Jobs in the mining industry pay well. In fact, wages often that exceed the private se sector average. An economic analysis of mining indicates that a single mine in Aroostook County could potentially create up to 700 direct and indirect jobs. At the same time, our quality of life is measured in large part by the state's natural resources and its physical beauty. Maintaining the pristine nature of our surroundings is vitally important to continuing to attract more businesses. It is critical that any legislation that advances mining requires strict protections for our environment. Maine's business community would not have it any other way. The rules before the committee today contain strict provisions in protecting Maine's natural beauty. Maine has a proud history of cre creating and revolution revolutionizing industries. From forest management to farming, from paper manufacturing to shipbuilding, we are viewed as leaders because we adapt to innovations and technologies. The Maine legislature is being presented with a unique opportunity, one that contains its tradition of leadership, renews our economic heritage, and supports the development of a new wave of investment. The Maine State Chamber of Commerce encourages members of the Environment and Natural Resources Committee to seize this opportunity and support the changes in the mining rules that are before the committee today. And I'm just going to go off my testimony a little bit. Um, you can read the final paragraph. I just want to highlight two other, uh, two other aspects. Um, there's an article from National Geographic from October of 2013 called Conflict Minerals. I would encourage members of this committee to read that article. You'll see where a lot of our metals that we have in our society today, where they come from in parts of the world and how they do mining. We have an opportunity here to show the world how, how to do mining. We can do it correctly, we can do it safely, and we can do it protecting our environment. The other uh, issue I'd just like to hit on is uh, at the State Chamber of Commerce, we do a lot with workforce development in our Making work, Main Work series. It's no secret, we are the oldest state in the nation. I heard some folks talking about earlier today in terms of these mining jobs require technical skills that we might have to bring people from out of state. I hope that's the case. I hope we bring these people out, they settle here, and they raise their families here in the state of Maine because we need to grow our state here and grow our economy, especially in areas of the state that could use it. Be happy to answer any questions. There's a little more uh, legislative history in my. Uh, Representative Welsh. Could you send us the link? Yeah. I, I will. I'll, I'll send you a link to the article. To it's, a, it's, very, it's a very good article, and it shows you uh, how this operates in other parts of the world. Representative Harlow. Yeah, that was done when uh, 1853 came before the legislature in the 125th. Mm -hmm. I believe it was planning decisions that did that economic analysis, and I'll get the, that information where that number comes from for you. Okay. You just need to Thank bring you. one copy, okay. over and we can work from there. You'll, bring a whole, you'll give us a whole report. Oh. Yeah, it was an economic analysis at that time okay. that was floating around where that name would come uh, from. But I'll, I'll, I'll pull it and bring it back to the committee all right, cool. for work Thank session. You. Okay. Actually, if you could get it to us before Ben, be, before Ben because the work sessions really will be delayed for a bit. So those that want to read it, it would be here in the library and they can certainly take time to oh, I'll bring it over to Tyler so everyone has a okay. copy. Yeah. All right. Yeah. What? Yeah. yeah we can read. Could we ask if we can all have a copy of yeah. it left for us so that we can read it? it, it, it yeah, if you want. We could uh, check I mean, it I, I just want to, <laughs> whether, I don't care who it is out there. If you want it, we'll get you a copy. But yeah. I just don't want to go make copies and then find out that, that they stay yeah. here and nobody really look. and I know you will. Okay. A link I will. and read it. Link, link read it, uh, and then yeah, if you want to print it, so if you send the link, okay. then what Tyler can do is he'll print it for you, then it's our paper. That would be the way to do it. So if okay. you want it, yeah, get the link, and then, then we can print it from there. That would be super. Okay. Thank you. That's great. Good. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Jeff Reardon. Good. I'm just checking to make sure it's not evening. Good afternoon. Good it's been a long day. Um, you have my written testimony, um, and um, 
so I'm not going to I'm not going to read a lot of this. Um, uh, those of you who've been on the committee for a long time uh, have have heard my concerns about mining in, in general and and some sites in Maine in particular before. Um, those of you who haven't have heard those concerns from other people before me, so uh, I'm not going to do any any preamble about that. Um, what I'm going to do uh, is actually something that both uh, Representative Martin and Senator Saviello asked uh, that uh, some of us do. Um, one is that attached to my um, testimony, and I apologize for dumping this much paper on you, but I did print double-sided, is a marked up version of the rules. Um, and somebody's got to ask me a question about that because there's some formatting weirdnesses I don't want to waste any of my time on. Okay, but I'll ask that's, that's there. Um, Senator Saviello, and with respect to your question about the, the nine items on the committee that folks worked on, I was part of that group. Um, there are clearly things in my comments that go beyond those nine issues, but the nine issues, I think, summarize the, 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 major, the major points, and uh, uh, there's a lot there. I think, I think there are 56 comments, some of which came from other people, some of which came from me, but I'm the one who's responsible for putting them in one place, so all the blame is mine. Um, as you can see from the two documents, uh, we think there's a lot of work still needed on these rules, and I'm going to argue that a, a lot of the issues that you're still wrangling with go back to the statute that was passed in 1853 and some issues that we talked about back in 2012 and through the process that we had there, which was long and involved, did not get to resolution of. Mining area is a great example. The definition for mining area we're suggesting here is one that a bunch of us, I think, I think uh, Nick and I and uh, maybe Sean Mahoney drafted back in 2012 and just we got it to you too late for you to get it in. Um, but I think there are some other big things that I'm going to suggest that you ought to change in statute. I don't know what the correct order is. Being a linear thinker, I think statute comes first and then rule. But um, as, as Nick said, you guys are going to do it the way you choose to do it. One is I think you need to add two approval criteria for a mine in Maine. This really goes to having the applicant demonstrate that their mine can be put in here safely and that they can come in establish the mine, do the work, and leave, and leave a clean site behind. One of those would be essentially, thou shall demonstrate that you can close the mine safely. And I, you see language that's a lot longer than that, but time's running short. Um, the second of those is related to post-closure treatment and some limitation on, on how that's done. I think that's important, not so much the, the length of time. There's a lot of argument about the, I'm not sure, 10 years isn't too long, but forcing people to plan for not to allow them to plan for a long period of water treatment, which allows more things to go wrong. Um, in addition, mining area needs to be clarified, um, and I think you should clarify in statute that full financial assurance should be up front. Um, there's some other, uh, I think, relatively big issues in the rules, and I just want to highlight a couple that haven't gotten a lot of attention today. One is um, in situ leaching, which as I understand that is heap leaching, where you pump the chemicals into the ground instead of putting the ore in a pile and dumping the chemicals over them. Not sure. I'm not an expert in in situ leaching. I think it's worth taking a look at whether Maine wants in situ leaching. We've already we've already banned heap leaching, and I think this may be similar. Um, and the second, uh, there's some guidance on this. I think from Alaska, where a lot of the newer modern mines are not using wet storage units at all. They're going to dry stacking all of their waste. Um, and whether in Maine, wet management units are appropriate, given all the concerns you heard earlier about hydrology and climate change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And my time, I'm I'm well past time now, so I'll stop. Questions, Representative Baker. Baker. Tucker. <laughs> Tucker. <laughs> well, it took you a minute to realize that too. <laughs> Represent um, Tucker. Could you uh, please explain the formatting on this uh, attachment? Sure. You're, you're, what, what you I see? I see some blank pages here, and I'm not yeah. sure it matches the pages on my copy. Now, what, what, what you see reflects um, my technical um, limitations. The, the rules, as I had them, the version I had them in was in a PDF document. I cut and pasted that PDF into Word so I could mark it up in a way. If you, trust me, if it was in my handwriting, you wouldn't want to try to read it. Um, and when I did that, the formatting got screwed up. So basically, every time I added a line, it would kick the last line of the page onto the next page. And then I couldn't delete all that blank space to just make it you know, half a page longer. So every place I added something, you got a blank page. And also, for reasons I truly don't understand, it did really weird things with page numbers. So you'll see, I think it goes page 29, 30, 31, 32, 29, 30, 31, 32. The stuff's all in the same order, but you're going to look at the page numbers and think it's out of order. And there are probably other formatting weirdnesses I haven't caught yet. But the substance is all there and in the same order as the original rule. I guarantee you the, the page numbers in the table of contents don't work, but they didn't in the original version either. <laughs> 
assistant Other questions? My, my wife has that role, but she's, she's, she's um, not willing to put in the time I require. So did you do this all in your own bedroom at the computer? All by I yourself? did it in a variety of places, including sitting here while I was listening to some other stuff a week or two ago. I probably shouldn't admit that, but. It's all right. This is open for everybody to use, even you. Senators, Representative Martin. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jeff. I don't want to make this more difficult for you, but there is a possi is there a possibility that you might redo it for us? <laughs> because to be honest, this will be very confusing. Um, or, or get someone to do it. Well, I mean, the reality, I, I'm a one-person shop, so either and and and, and I would have done it. It's, okay. it. It was not that I didn't have the time to do it. Right. It was literally that. Okay. In the format it was in, without losing all the track changes, which of course were all the changes I added, okay. I couldn't go back and fix that format. So, so the changes you made are the ones we then end up with an empty page after that? Uh, the changes are in standard track changes format. So for example. Yeah, give us an example. Uh, let me look at a page that's got, take a look at uh, page four, which is actually page four. That one's not screwed up yet. Uh, Page four, you'll see, um, look at the top of the page under T, buffer. I'm suggesting adding the phrase reducing, it's underlined, reducing air or water pollution to the definition of buffer. Okay. Um, if you look, I guess I don't see any cuts on here, but if there are cuts, they'd show a strike through. Right. And then if you look in the right-hand column, there's a bunch of formatting comments, which is just what Word does with formatting, and, and ignore those, but you'll see comment. Also, a change needed in statute to add similar language as a condition of permit approval. And the similar language there is to, to return the mining area to a condition that is hydrologically, geologically, and chemically stable, does not contain, does not contain public safety or other hazards, and approximates the pre-mining baseline. But, and I don't want to commit myself to this at this point, but I think if we do put that language in the rule, and it, it's adopted in the rule, then it becomes the law by implication and that would be what we'd have to follow. So I think we can get around, I mean we can get to the issue you want to get by putting those things into rule. And, but I go back, I don't want to commit myself to that right now, but that's my, that's my recollection. Yeah, it, it, if I may, and it may be that the argument about whether it's in statute or rule is somewhat right. arcane, but if you accept this change here, Right. All you've changed is the definition of closure. Right. And to be specific, what I'm suggesting is you want, in addition to changing the definition of closure there, you also want an approval standard that is similar. You right. will demonstrate right. that you can do these various things. And the wordsmithing of that, right. I, I gave you language, and, you know, and, I'm not the world's best drafter. And what you'd have to do basically is, is say, indicate that the department is, uh, is, has to require this in that process and that I think would get us to where you it, want to get us. Yeah, I, I think so. The, yeah. the other thing just to say, um, again, this was a summary of comments and you'll see this in the preamble that I added at the top of it. It is not a, if you hit accept all the changes, you will come out with a rule that does everything perfectly. It's still definitely going to need, in addition to all my formatting uh, screw ups, it's, <coughs> it's going to need, you know, tweaking after that so it's still a document right. that makes sense. Yes, right. Some of these are big changes. But we could do that in the rule process to get to that stage. You I'm could. Quite, I'm, I, I'm quite sure that's accurate because I think that I want to go back to the original law that I was a sponsor of. The one thing that we did and the way it was done that way, we did not want to do things that over time would end up changing and be required to change law changes, but then we could move on and the department could then promulgate rules it, and have more leniency and ability to get to the what had to be accomplished in the end. Because over time, as hopefully as, as things evolve, uh, the, the ability to do things in water control and taking care of water, the, we'll be in a better position to do that as technology changes. And that was one of the things that when I went through that four years ago, whatever it was now, that's where uh, some of us are coming from. Thank you. If, if I may, the, the only other thing I would add to that, and again, the, the committee's going to decide what you do in statute and what you do in rule. I will say that when you had the briefing, whatever that was, 10 days ago, I heard from both ex-chairman Foley, now Representative Foley, um, and I think from Heather, that in some cases, um, um, on behalf of the department, that in some cases um, they didn't go farther than they did, in part because they didn't have guidance from you 
telling them they should go farther than they did. So that's this whole question of statute versus rule yeah. is confusing and difficult. Right. But with the crowd that we have now on this committee, I don't think you have to worry about that. Okay. Other questions? Of course, I had the same question that I asked uh, Mr. Bennett. You've given us a list of 10, now you've given us a list of another 50. <laughs> so where, where, where but many of them are included in the 10. Okay, so, so if we solve the 10 or 11 or whatever it is, you're going to be satisfied. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I've said this since 2012. I'm not advocating for a mining moratorium. If I was, I'd be here advocating for a mining moratorium. I, I don't know whether mining can be done safely in Maine or not. I know that for it to be done safely, we need stronger standards than we have. And we've kind of laid out what we think, the how the standards need to be strengthened. So we can capture all of that stuff. I think it's, as you can tell, I think it's a big job. But, um, you know, I'm not... We're not, I'm not going to be in, you know, bring you another rock mode. <laughs> we get the one list and the new list. I, right. I've been on the other side of that from time to time. Representative Deshane. Thank you, Senator. When I started to read your comments and I got my email, I said, oh, geez, we could, I suppose, rewrite all of the rules ourselves, but we don't want to do that. So what we're going to end up doing, I think, is taking all of your comments, all the comments from everybody, crafting what direction it is we're going to get to give to the department, and then they'll do their role of creating rules, taking the BEP and going through the process again. Uh, so I, my question to you is, you'll help us, right? I, I, I will, <laughs> but, but I'll, I'll say I, I think the process you're talking about is a different one from the one Representative Martin is it talking about. And I, I'll help you either way. <laughs> okay. I prefer your approach, but mm -hmm. others may not. Yeah. There's also, so you know, your list, uh, this is going to be, it isn't just so, we've given it to DEP to ask under those why they couldn't write the rules because of statutes, parcel, okay. where the statute got in the way or didn't address it. Thanks. Other questions? Okay, thank, thank you, you all. Jeff. Anthony. Then Pat, is Pat here still? Yeah. Oh, you, oh, there you are. Come sit down so I can see you. You got the memo about yellow shirts, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, good afternoon, Senator Saviello, Representative Walsh, distinguished members of the committee. My name is Anthony Hauer and I represent Aroostook Resources. We're a company that's got uh, an interest in seeing, see, looking at the viability of a potential uh, mining project in the state of Maine. The rules you have before you and the discussion you've had all this long day for you folks, I'm sure, um, has come from a very robust process that unfolded over uh, a couple of years. We believe that the rules you have in front of you today are adequate to allow responsible development of a mining industry in the state of Maine. The, uh, the keys that we believe were critical in any rule when you look across the country and into other countries are the requirement that financial assurance be up front. And that's provided for in these rules you have in front of you that the financial assurance is required and it must be reviewed annually to ensure that the amounts are still adequate to, for reclamation or any other work that needs to be done. Secondly, uh, when we went through the process back in 2012 and again last year, a lot of talk of legacy mines. And 1853 that now uh, promulgated these rules, the permittee has to demonstrate a full plan. So from development through operation to closure, post-closure, reclamation, outlining the uh, monitoring and the contingency plans have to be in place. And that's critical in this day and age. Uh, you've seen in there where the, uh, the waste uh, from the mine has to be characterized in the different uh, classifications so the DEP staff can look at the design and engineering at the time of permitting and determine if this is appropriate or proposed to the uh, um, the developer to go back and find alternatives. We think that's important. There's no perpetual water treatment allowed under these rules. 30-year limit for active water treatment, and we believe in that. These uh, rules include performance standards that expressly state that all mine operations in each stage from development through post-closure must meet all standards for ground and surface water and air quality, as well as minimizing acid rock drainage and any leaching during the operation. So we think those are very strong parts of these rules. If the esteemed members of this uh, committee uh, decide that they want to change some things as they go ahead, which it sounds like probably they do, we have a few areas of concern that uh, we would like to have looked at as well. Uh, under performance efforts, uh, more particularly siting, there is a requirement of a one-mile buffer from state-owned lands. We think this creates a very big shadow effect on private landowners in the state of Maine, tying up hundreds of thousands of acres, and in, in doing so could take value away from landowners. Are also a little afraid that uh, 
it gives more ammunition to people that uh, this is another reason uh, not to participate in Lands for Maine's future because you're creating this shadow. On the monitoring reporting section, there's a requirement to undertake compliance monitoring on an area that has been approved for future activity but isn't currently <coughs> active. We feel this is very impractical and costly. We believe this should be a monitoring well, not a compliance point because you're going to mine there within the next few months or the next few years. So we believe the compliance points should be agreed upon up front and then a, a cluster of monitoring wells put into different areas so people can judge what's happening on the site. And lastly, under the financial assurance, it seems counterintuitive to us that the department must choose the higher of the, uh, in calculating the financial assurance, sorry, the department must choose the highest alternative cost option and add a 15% contingency. We just think that's, uh, could greatly increase the cost to a developer, and we agree with having a third party involved, but then uh, uh, you know, it should be a, a qualified third party to assist the department. So I thank you for your time. I know you've had a long day. Uh, I look forward to uh, working with you as you go through this, and uh, <coughs> thanks for the opportunity. So. Questions? Representative Duchesne. Thank you, uh, Senator. One of the things that struck me is nobody so far has actually come and said they want to mine anywhere within uh, within a mile of any of these uh, parks, lands, et cetera. Uh, nobody so far has supported the idea of doing it. Uh, is that in any way changed? Uh, I, I can't speak to other landowners. I just know when we look at it, and, and state parks, I believe, are different than public lots and things like that. We have many public lots scattered around Aroostook County, uh, and it, it creates a big shadow effect in some cases. And again, that's speaking from our point of view. Uh, with our land holdings in Aroostook, uh, we would have be greatly impacted, not knowing where other deposits are today, mm -hmm. but I can't speak for the other. And landowners. is there any intention that you know of, of, of mining under surface waters or streams or anything like that? Well, certainly under surface streams. I know uh, I've visited probably a dozen, a dozen mines in the last number of years, and uh, when you have underground mining, a lot of that happens under streams and lakes, in fact, in places under the Atlantic Ocean and Cape Breton. Mm -hmm. So uh, Great. Thanks. Represent Senator Green. Thank you. Um, the gentleman from the Maine State Chamber of Commerce just spoke, and did you hear his remarks about the economic impact study? I did. And um, if I understand correctly, it was your, did your company uh, commission that study? We did. And are you, are you in agreement that you're going to provide it to the committee? Would that be okay? We'll look at it and decide if we can release it in whole or in part. Uh, that was part of a bigger project that we worked on, including different operating scenarios. So we, we will certainly get you some. I'll have to just discuss with our owners whether we release it in its entirety, but we can search you get you the economic information. It was done out of planning decisions. Mm -hmm. So you might, you, you're, you'll let us know about that? Yes, we, we will get you some information. I'm just not sure. I'd have to go back and look at the entire report to see if, if we wanted that in the public at this point or not. Okay. Well, this, the part that I'm specifically interested in is the part about um, potential employment benefits yeah. in the area. So yeah, so we've, we've certainly, uh, there's a, a summary of, uh, of the 700 jobs, 300 direct, 400 indirect. Uh, there's the tax implications, the off spins that were all derived from the models that Charles Lawton ran. So we'll, yeah. we'll certainly supply that. The more detail, the better. Right. Thank you. Representative Welsh. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, would you differentiate public lands from state and national parks? Yeah, and, and I'm not the best one to talk to all the different classifications of the land, but uh, you know, state, state and national parks obviously have been set aside for one uh, aspect for the society. Then you've got uh, some of the reserve lands, you've got wildlife refugees, and they all have different uh, levels of protection and different values. Uh, but then you've got these public lots that basically my understanding in the county, and I could be way off on this, is that and I'm sure Representative Martin can fill me in because he was involved with some of them, <laughs> was that the, the minority interest in many of the townships was traded away um, over time and con consolidated in one area so the paper companies didn't have to deal with the state. So in the middle of many of our holdings, we have a 500-acre lot and then a 200-acre lot, and then you've got the Eagle Lake Township, which is where most of it went. So that's our concern. It's not so much the uh, things like the Allagash or the state parks. It's, it's these uh, public lots that create a big shadow, potentially. Those were all called undivided ownerships at one time, correct? Right, correct. Which means they were put in place to, for fire protection right. many, many, many years ago. And so we've carved that out to get out of that undivided ownerships. And aren't those public lots oftentimes traded? They have been. They've been moved around a lot. And I know in the case of, uh, of Eagle Lake, my understanding is a bunch of the companies, including uh, one of our affiliates at the time, 
uh, traded their uh, their minority interest out to the state so they could consolidate consolidate in one township. Other questions, Representative Harlow. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I'm looking at the second bullet on your second page where it says the rules ensure that there is no perpetual water treatment and limit active treatment to 30 years. Could you just explain that? Um, so, so my understanding of the rules uh, when I read them is it said that there is there shall be no active water treatment on a mine site beyond 30 years. We can find that in the rules. Uh, some sake has said some some of us read that that's pretty clear, but we can we can clarify that certainly for work session. Yeah, and we can certainly help point out where that might be good to give us that citation, yeah. Anthony, when you get a chance. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Patrick Strout. Well, um, the rules we think are very well written. We participated in an exhaustive process and we think it's time to move forward. Um, the landowners uh, all have varying degrees of interest in mining. They have deposit, we have major deposits scattered throughout the uh, North <coughs> Country and I think they're all watching to see what the opportunities will be in the future. Uh, although I know of nobody actively um, moving forward with uh, planning on moving forward with a, with um, activity in a in a major way, uh, in some cases we have landowners that don't have the mineral rights uh, to their land. They've been retained by other landowners, so there's it's kind of an interesting dynamic. But in that perspective, I think uh, we are concerned with the distance from uh, major features, the limitation by the one mile mark. Um, we can see. Uh, watersheds, uh, the Allagash Wilderness Waterway, all of those um, kinds of features may be, um, it may be too arbitrary to set a one mile uh, limit and it may be more site specific to the kind of geology and hydrogeology just taking place on the site. I think at one time we talked about a quarter mile um, being the preferred distance. So <coughs> that concern. Um, but once the rules are approved, um, um, we think it's important to move far forward with a project and go through a permitting process to see if the rules work, to see if we can really physically deal with a site on the ground. We'll learn a lot from that and um, we'll see if it's economically and environmentally possible. So thank you very much. Question for Patrick. Oh, okay. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Caitlin, I saw you move up, so you're ready. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, could I just respond to that, uh, or Matt, ask a question of Mr. Holohan on his 30 years? I'd just like to point out the, f the answer to that question about the 30 years. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Usually we don't do that, but that would I help. understand. That it says on page 55, a wet mine waste unit may be considered for a longer defined period of more than 30 years by the department, provided the department determines it is the most practical alternative for waste management. Wait, that's not, I don't think, wait, wait, I can't say it is considered active treatment. That's, the that's a passive treatment. Yes. That's the difference. But thank you. Uh, all right, uh, where are you? There you are. Good afternoon. Thank you guys for toughing out this long day. Um, Senator Saviello, Representative Welsh, and members of the Committee on Environment and Natural Resources. My name is Caitlin Bernard. I'm here today on behalf of the Appalachian Mountain Club and our 5,200 members in Maine. I grew up in Aroostook County, so this issue has been something I've been involved in for a while. Um, and I'm here to raise some major concerns with the proposed Chapter 200 rules. Um, the AMC is the nation's oldest outdoor recreation and conservation organization, and we're dedicated to promoting the protection, enjoyment, and understanding of the mountains, forests, waters, and trails. In Maine, we are a large landowner. We own 70,000 acres of land in Piscataquis County, and we focus our initiatives on outdoor recreation, resource protection, sustainable forestry, and community partnerships. We opposed these rules when they were provisionally adopted in 2014. We're still concerned with the statewide implications of opening up mining development, uh, I've outlined a few specifics in my testimony, and I'll go over a couple of those briefly. I know you've heard a lot today. Um, as a conservation recreation and outdoor recreation organization, AMC is primarily and especially concerned about 
The provisions of the rules that threaten public lands and water bodies, um, Representative Duchesne mentioned that earlier, and I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't been, I've been over at ACF and approps, so I, I didn't hear everything, all the questions from earlier, but um, the buffer requirements around public lands and water bodies are of specific concern to us. Um, we suggest that the rules should specifically prohibit mining on all public lands and public reserve lands by deleting the following language. You can find that in my written testimony. Um, the language would make public reserve lots open up to mining. Um, these lots are managed by the state to serve public interest but would be open to mining development. Um, three of these valuable public reserve lots fall within the Moosehead Lake region where AMC owns and manages our property. Um, the state of Maine invested six million dollars of public money in the Katahdin Ironworks Conservation Project and it manages it for conservation and public access. These public lots fall <clears throat> wholly or partially within this conservation property and have been managed for decades for a variety of resources. Um, we're also concerned about the water bodies of the state. Mining should not be allowed in the water bodies I've listed here. Similar to a lot of our colleagues we've worked with were concerned about that. Um, we're also concerned that the rules never mention underground mining, so that's a pretty small word change, but certainly a big impact. So we hope that you look at that, that section of the rules. Um, like many others here today, we are concerned about perpetual treatment. We think that there should be a 10-year closure period. We are also concerned about the definition of mining area. We were concerned about that in the last iteration of these rules. We think that that should be more clearly defined based on the um, LD1302 that you guys saw last session. Um, and again, financial assurance requirements, we want to make sure that the taxpayers of Maine are protected. So i uh, happy to take any questions. questions. Thank you for. Were you involved with uh, the information that was provided to Representative DeShane? Yes. So you're in the same question. So if we can solve those problems, should be okay. Uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I am looking forward to working on solving a lot of those problems. Um, no, it's not. But I'm not going to push it. It's too late. <laughs> I would have to look at what you what was. What, I think you need to look at it very carefully. Absolutely. Very very carefully. I certainly will. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Beth Hearn. Good afternoon, Senator Saviella, Representative Walsh, and members of the Environment and Natural Resources Committee. My name is Beth Ahern, and I'm testifying on behalf of the Environmental Priorities Coalition. <laughs> we are a group of 31 environmental and public health organizations who unify around a common agenda each year. We represent collectively over 100,000 people who want to protect the good health, good jobs, and quality of life that depend upon a healthy environment. Defeating LD146 is an environmental priority for this year. Um, we're testifying today because we do not believe that the rules are strong enough to protect water quality or the taxpayer. And I, you have heard what I have written here, so I am not going to read it to you. I think you'd appreciate that at this time. Um, my three bullets are rules don't require payment of 100% of closure and remediation costs up front and do not require a third party assessment of those costs. We think that you can fix those things. Two, number two, the rules allow that mines me designed that would require perpetual water treatment. I disagree with what Mr. Horahan said, and I think you can fix that as well. And number three, the, the rules don't cl clarify what a mining area is, and I also believe that you can address that. And with that, thank you very much for your time today. Questions? I have the same question. Were you part of that information? That was yes. Covered? And so if we solve that? Yes, if you solve all those problems, we're good. And my other question, and I didn't ask anybody else, but I'll save this for you. Oh, no. I put 100% uh, up, and all I do is build a road. How soon do I get the money back? All I do is build the road. I get in there, and I find out the market falls apart. There's no need to mine it. When do I get my money back? I, I don't have the expertise you to, to answer. need to give some, some, some thought to that. So how far? That's why the percentage of development becomes important as you pay the fee. Just give some thought to that. Isn't that so? <laughs> yeah. Any other Thank questions? You. Thank you. James Mitchell. And then Chris, Chris, Chris Buchanan, are you, you're here? Okay. She waited patiently in the other room. You'll be the last one. Is there anybody else in here that wants to testify that has not? 
you raise your hand, we'll shoot. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, James. Senator Saviello, Representative Welsh, members of the committee. My name is Jim Mitchell. I'm from Hollowell, and I'm here today on behalf of Aristic Resources. Tyler is um, kindly passing out a document uh, submitted by Jim Butler. Uh, for those of you who were here during the 125th, you may recall Mr. Butler represented Aristic Resources for much of the work sessions, the nine work sessions the committee held, held and was very helpful given his uh, extensive experience in the mining industry. Um, rather than summarize Mr. Butler's testimony, however, I thought it would be a little more uh, helpful to you to be responsive to some concerns that were expressed on a number of occasions by citizens who came before you. Uh, worried about the future burden to taxpayers from uh, a failing uh, mine operator and how the taxpayers would be burdened with reclamation and cleanup uh, in that event. I think the financial assurance section of the rules is particularly important for alleviating perhaps your concerns on that, particularly page 46 of the rules. And I'm going to quote very briefly from it because the implication really is, is that uh, the worry that's expressed by the citizens who came before you today is that a shell company or a company that goes bankrupt then will be unable to meet the conditions of the financial assurance that is provided to the regulator. I think it's very important to keep in mind that it is expressly uh, written in the rules on page 46, and I quote, uh, roughly quote, the trust fund must not, the trust fund being the entity that's holding uh, the financial assurance instrument, the trust fund must not constitute an asset of the permittee and must be established to ensure the funds will be available to the department and not any creditor, including in the event of bankruptcy. That's a critical feature of the financial assurance provision. So whether or not the mine operator goes bankrupt, the instrument underlying the financial security for the taxpayers is that it's irrevocable and that it will be available to the department in the event that the mine operator fails. So I appreciate that many, many citizens came before you today and expressed concern about the burden that a mine operation could place on future taxpayers or themselves. <laughs> but in evaluating that financial assurance provision, I think you can reassure yourselves that that's simply not the case, the way the rules are drafted. With that, I'll conclude my testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much, and members of the committee. Questions? I have one question. Um, I believe you've been provided by the list of 11. Like a gang of 11? Uh, from Representative DeShane? Yes. Uh, if you would look that over too and, and see what you, your thoughts are on that. We, we certainly will evaluate it and uh, provide uh, some comments back and try to work with the committee to see if we can come to some reasonable accommodation on some of the concerns. I will say, uh, candidly, uh, we support the rules as drafted. The department spent 14 months uh, with a world class uh, consultant drafting very protective rules based on a law that passed uh, with si substantial majorities in the House and Senate and actually received the vote of nine members of this committee in the 125th. And so, and they were, that bill, I've been a lobbyist for 24 years, a uh, registered lobbyist for 24 years, no bill I ever observed in the course of my work here at the legislature accepting the budgets had received more scrutiny by a committee than that bill, except perhaps one, which was the electric industry restructuring, which totally changed our economy. And so it was very extensive work over a full month with more than nine, nine work sessions, a public hearing, two other briefings, very, very extensive work by the committee. And many of these issues were hammered out and argued and fought about and compromises reached. It's not as though industry wrote that law. We provided a template, and then the committee took it apart and implemented a very rigorous framework for the rules that were drafted. And the department did a great job in promulgating rules. In fact, they went beyond what the law, in our view, permitted, particularly around financial assurance. So with that, Mr. Chairman, a little diatribe I'll conclude. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your diatribe. Uh, the rules, as you know, changed some of the trust fund part. They did, certainly did. Did it make it even more restrictive than what we proposed? They, they sure did, extensively uh, more restrictive. And in fact, the, that argument was held at this committee. Uh, about whether or not a trust fund should be required. Uh, I testified about it. Uh, I asserted that it was unnecessary, that the regulator herself or himself uh, should have the authority to uh, uh, manage uh, the irrevocable financial assurance instrument. Uh, the committee decided that was appropriate. The department went beyond that. They are requiring that a trustee be found to manage the funds. 
Any other questions? Representative Tucker. This is a genuine question. Uh oh, yes, sir. <laughs> I, I need your help to understand what your interpretation is. Right. On page 46, the same page yes. that you were talking about where you, where you went into the uh, trust fund being an asset. Right. Uh, in the upper part of that section, it says that when a trust fund is utilized as the instrument, the permittee shall deposit the required financial assurance prior to the commencement of construction sufficient to conduct reclamation closure, post-closure, and corrective actions, and then here's the critical, as if the operations were to cease in the upcoming year. Mm -hmm. Now, is that language say that you post your trust fund uh, assets as you go, or does it mean that you post them all at, all at the very beginning <coughs> and then you adjust them I think there are two, um, in my interpretation of the rules, and again, uh, Representative Tucker, I'm not a lawyer, uh, but my interpretation of the rules, my reading of them, and my consultation uh, with our lawyer is the following. There are uh, several mechanisms for the department to adjust uh, the financial assurance, up or down. Part of it is uh, how far construction has occurred, what is planned. Uh, another part of it is if new technology comes about that uh, indicates that may be more expensive, in fact, for appropriate reclamation, closure, or remediation. The department can then go to the permittee and say, you know, new technology has been uh, invented and is being deployed. You ought to uh, rethink your financial assurance for the future because we're going to require your reclamation project to deploy that technology. And so there are several mechanisms to adjust it. But for your particular instance, I believe what's happened here is, the, is as Representative DeShane pointed out, or perhaps with Senator Saviello, if you only build a road, requiring the full amounts of what potentially was permitted for the mine wouldn't be appropriate. Uh, there is uh, some degree of likelihood that as the mine operation occurs, uh, new deposits could be dis discovered or the assays weren't quite uh, accurate and therefore there's less uh, uh, mineable material that is economic to recover and so they're not going to mine as far as the permit had allowed. But so what happens here is that what the department is requiring is that as you go, you've got to continually plan, as you did in your original application, how you're going to close and remediate the facility. That is one of the most important changes in mining technology over the last couple of decades. In the old days, they built the mine and they operated it, and when they closed it, they figured out how to remediate. And that's what's wrong with a lot of legacy mines. What's required now in the department is very stringent on this part, in Jim Butler's estimate. Uh, more stringent than any jurisdiction he's worked in, and he's worked in many countries and many states in the U.S. What the department is requiring is a much more stringent plan for you to determine as you go how you're going to close and reclaim uh, areas that have been mined. And, and that is a very important consideration to the financial assurance as well. So it's, you look a year ahead. Yes, sir. And you estimate what are the potential costs and risks based on the work that will be done in the next year. Yes, sir. Okay. And, now, and the potential liabilities occurred from that, occurring from that now, work. Who is the person who gauges that risk? I believe it's the regulator. The DEP? Yes, sir. The main DEP? Yes, sir. Have they had any experience in metallic mining? Um, I think that uh, they've had a fair amount of experience in evaluating the risks. Now, I'm not sure if any current regulators have that experience in the department, but I would say this. I would expect they'd hire some experts to assist them. In fact, I think, I think that was debated the and may very well be a part of the law. Well, it does. It says it they is. may. Yeah. Uh, but don't you think it would be important that it put in that they shall hire an independent expert with experience in this type of financial and risk analysis? Without the benefit of a consultant with my client, I would expect that we would support such a change. Because having uh, world-class expertise to apply to these issues is actually works both ways. It defends the public interest, but it also actually uh, helps the mine operator as well. Uh, because someone who's extremely experienced uh, may be able to make a more precise evaluation of the future potential costs experienced and independent. Yes, absolutely. Yes, sir. Representative DeShane and Representative Harlow. Thank you, Senator. I'm just refreshing my memory on trust and see if you remember what this